All right, let's get started. Where do I begin? Well, let me say that I actually have a hard time deciding where to begin. It's kind of like the course will make sense when it's all done. At least I hope it does. Um, so what I'm going to do here is kind of quickly run through a little bit of everything and then we're actually going to go back and go through everything in a lot of detail again. And even when we do that, it's still not going to make sense. Trust me, it will by the time we get there. It's just there's a lot to know and we got to kind of put it all together. So let's start talking about mass spectrometry. The first thing that I want to tell you is that in order to get a mass spectrum for, you know, anything, let's say this the stuff that's inside of this uh, piece of coal, rock, uh, organic, inorganic material, we can do mass spec of pretty much anything. But there are a few steps we have to do. One of the things we need to do is get our compounds into the gas phase. So evaporate our molecules so that they're, they're gases. You can do mass spec of a liquid. You can do mass spec of a solid. You just have to get it into the gas phase. From there with mass spec, we're always talking about M over Z. The Z of mass spec is charge. So we need to ionize our molecules. There are all kinds of different ways. So yeah, imagine lightning hits it and electrons are hitting, but um, we gotta have a molecule's charge and it could be positive, it could be negative. Here I'm showing you positive ions. Of course, mass spectrometry involves measuring compounds by their M over Z. So we're looking for differences in M over Z. So we're gonna separate them. And maybe we're thinking it's got something to do with magnets, but not necessarily. There are different ways to separate compounds according to M over Z. And lastly, we need to be able to detect our compounds. So let's just imagine that they've hit some type of a wall and then that, that collision of charge with the, with the surface allows us to cause a, a measure in, in the current. The order of these steps does not matter at all. And in fact, sometimes you can't really separate the steps. In other words, step one and two might happen together. Step three and four might happen at the same time. But mass spectrometry does always involve these four steps in some different way. All right, let's just look at the competition here. If you're going to characterize your compounds, then there's all kinds of choices available to you. And it's hard to argue which one of them is better. I mean, it really depends on what you want to do. So for example, if you want to know bond angles, we got to use x-ray crystallography, or at least that's one of the techniques we use. Uh, NMR is a great technique, but you know, it's based on NMR active compounds. Um, IR Raman, the list could go on. I will say that one of the great advantages of all of these techniques is that when you think about how we measure a compound, usually you're putting your sample into a vial, right? Like maybe a lot, but at least by the time you've done your experiment, you still have that sample. So you basically recycled your material. You haven't really lost any of it. So that's the advantage of these techniques. The disadvantage is that in many cases, you actually need a fair amount of material. Now, what's a lot? Like, is a milligram a lot? Is a nanogram a lot? It, it depends on your molecule. It depends how much you have to work with. So these compound, these techniques are, relatively speaking, not as sensitive as mass spectrometry. So to give you a sample of how sensitive mass spectrometry is, the picture that you're looking at here is, is not an image like, like a, a microscope or, or a, a photographic image. These are mass spectra, or at least it's a way of representing mass spectra. So imagine, if you will, that you have like a laser or something that's shining a, a small little dot onto one point in the fingerprint. And then that laser blasts off a bunch of molecules, and a mass spectrometer is going to sense those molecules. Then you shift the laser over just a tiny little fraction of an inch and do that again. So if you record many, many of these together, and then think of a different mass to charge as a different color, if you will, just to represent it, just so our brains can understand what we're looking at. And you can actually record a picture using mass spectrometry, where in this case, every different color actually represents a different kind of molecules. So think about how little material that is. You could literally take a finger and just touch it onto a surface. The amount of residue left over on the surface is more than enough material to take a mass spectrum, actually to take thousands of mass spectra. The work that I'm showing you here is, is presented by uh, Dr. Pierre Chorin from the University of Montreal. So there are other people who do this type of work, but this is the kind of stuff that we're gonna take a look at over the course of the semester. In other words, not just focusing on, let's say traditional mass spectrometry, I want you to see the latest and the greatest in, in mass spec innovations.
So I threw out the word sensitivity. Now let's just make sure that we understand what that means. And to an analytical chemist, sensitivity is simply a term referring to a calibration curve. So if you imagine here, we got the slope of this line, the concentration is going to be proportional to the slope. In other words, the sensitivity. And yes, sensitivity and slope mean literally the same thing. So if I looked at a different calibration curve where the slope is higher, then we can say that whatever's sensing that is actually more sensitive. Let's just use these pictures as an example of sensitivity. I'm gonna show you a picture, actually a shape, and over the course of the video, I just basically pause the video when you decide that you can see the shape. All right, so go. Do you see it yet? Okay, that's as far as we go. Now, can you see a star in all of the squares. Maybe it depends on your monitor, maybe it depends on your eyes, but you could say, well, I can barely make out that, tri that, that triangle, I can barely make out that star in the, in the top left corner. Um, there's one in the bottom right corner, but do I see it? Are your eyes sensitive enough? Is the display that you're looking at sensitive enough to see a difference in the light intensity? So if you can see it, or if your monitor displays it, then you're saying that it's very sensitive. I always have a, a hard time with one of them. Right now I can see it, but I'm just curious if you can. Let's just take a look at an actual mass spectrum. Well, okay, a fake mass spectrum. The first thing you'll notice is that the x-axis will be labeled M over Z. So that's to distinguish it from, I don't know, an absorbent spectrum where it's wavelength or a chromatogram that has time. So M over Z, you read that as mass to charge, but it's acceptable to say M over Z. And the intensity is, well, the, the amount of signal that you see. So let's just take a couple of hypothetical molecules, doesn't really matter what they are, and we're gonna assume that they have different masses. So that means they'll show up at different places along the M over Z axis. The signal height, the intensity, tells us something about how concentrated our sample is, how much there is, but it's a little bit misleading. If I were to compare the triangle and the circle, you'd say, well, the red signal's higher, so there must be more of it. Not always. It does depend on the response, on the sensitivity of these different compounds. Now, the other kind of mass spectrum that we could get would be what we call a fragmentation spectrum or a tandem MS spectrum, depending. We'll, we'll talk about that later. So imagine we only have one single molecule, but I found a way to break it apart. So now we have pieces of the molecule, and in this case, they all add up to the whole. They don't necessarily have to. But if each of these pieces has a charge, then we could record a mass spectrum for them. And they might have different intensities as well. So this is a real one. Now this is the mass spectrum of caffeine. The molecular weight of caffeine is 194 grams per mole, which we don't really use the unit grams per mole in a mass spectrum. You just see the, the unit U. So that signifies atomic mass units. Um, but you see a big signal for 194. The signals at lower mass to charge, 109 and those other ions, they're pieces of the caffeine, and, and some type of, of experiment was done to basically break down this molecule into pieces. You can also see these little kind of satellite signals hanging out, like there's, there's one that's just a little bit higher than 194. Uh, there's also one that's a little bit less. The one that's a little higher than 194, that actually refers to an isotope. So we'll talk a lot about isotopes when it comes to mass spectrometry analysis. I'll just give you a sneak peek here and say that the periodic table, the molecular weights that you understand, you're actually gonna to have to unlearn everything you know. So the molecular weight uh, or the atomic mass of carbon, 12.01 and all the digits, it's not. Carbon is carbon 12. It's actually the only one that's easy to remember uh, because that atomic mass unit scale was based on mass of carbon, which is exactly 12. So that's another thing we'll talk about quite a bit um, in the coming week. So here's a picture of a mass spectrometer. It's actually the same one that I use in my research lab. Uh, it's called an ion trap mass spectrometer. And I just wanna kind of walk through some of the main components just to even get a sense of how a mass spectrometer works. The, the, the weird thing about it is that there are many different kinds of mass spectrometers. They come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them would, would fill up a room. Others you can put in the palm of your hand. Uh, this one is about the size of like a, a dishwasher, I guess. Uh, so it's kind of intermediate range. It's a bench top instrument. So I guess we'll start where it all begins at the source. The source is the interface between the world and the inside of the mass spectrometer. So it's how our, our compounds get into the instrument. It's also often the place where the compounds get vaporized and ionized. 
So one example of that, with the one that you see on that instrument there, is called electrospray ionization. It's basically like a needle that sprays a solution. You can see them coming out as like a fine mist, and then the compounds are charged within that mist. So how does it work? I mean, in a nutshell, it's a proton transfer reaction. It's acid-based chemistry. So you imagine just transferring a proton, usually you have acid in the solution, and it protonates your molecule. So you could actually write a little equation. We have our neutral compound that picks up a proton in some acid-based transfer, and we protonate. Of course, you can do the opposite. You can make a negative compound by deprotonating. That's just one example, but there's another example here that's quite common uh, called electron ionization. And in that case, if we have our molecule, we'd fire an electron beam at it. So an electron hits it with a lot of energy, and in the process, another electron gets knocked off. If that electron carries a negative charge, then it leaves our compound with a positive charge in its place. Um, the spectrum of caffeine that you saw was actually recorded using electron ionization. So back to the instrument, when you go past the ionization source and into the mass spectrometer, you have what we call the mass analyzer. The mass analyzer, we call it like the heart of the instrument. It's where separation actually takes place. In some cases, you have a magnet. In this case, it's based on electric fields. So I'll just explain very roughly how it works. I imagine the ion trap kind of like a box. It literally is a box. And we have our electrospray source is going to push ions into that. And at the back end, we'll have a detector. We'll be able to record a spectrum. But notice that the spectrum is, is actually saying time. Now, let's just say that there's some magic happening. And the ions are going to be held inside of that box. Uh, and then eventually, we'll let them out one by one. And let me just repeat that so you can kind of understand what we see. As the ions come in, they're ejected one by one. But they're ejected in different, different sizes. And the signals that we get, we're just basically recording the time that they come out. So there will be some type of equation that allows us to convert that time signal into a mass of charge signal. So we'll go through how that works, as well as many other types of mass analyzers. And lastly, I'll just mention that mass spectrometry always takes place in a vacuum. There's many reasons for that, but basically the entire system is enclosed and we have a big pumping system that's going to suck the air out of it. We won't worry about how that works. Right now you're looking at a turbo molecular pump, which is like a jet engine kind of, kind of system that just sucks all the air out. So I'd say in a nutshell, that's pretty much the entire course. We'll go through each of those topics. We're going to go through all kinds of different mass analyzers, different ways of ionization, understanding how the data is read, how to interpret a mass spectrum. Um, but that's essentially what we're looking at. And then what you're going to do to help out in this course is that you're going to pick up one of those aspects or one of the applications of this type of instrument and then bring it to life. So don't think of mass spectrometry as like one single kind of machine that does one single thing. Mass spectrometry is almost like a computer. There's like no end to what you can actually do with it once you fully understand and appreciate what it's designed to do. So we'll see you in the next video.